welcome to another fit video today we are fitting the road bike now the road bike has such critical fit that I've spent the entire year trying to figure out how to do this video so there's plenty of videos out on uh, YouTube that uh, will give you the quick fit but this is going to be an ultra detailed one telling you everything you need to know so it's going to be another long video so this time I'm going to split the video up into sections and at the beginning of the video you will see <clears throat> the names of the sections and the times to, to uh, fast forward to them. Just take the little YouTube bar at the bottom and move it forward to that time and you can start that section. I would encourage you to watch the entire video because there's going to be a, a lot of information in here and you don't want to miss anything. So we're going to start the video off with why would you even buy a road bike and who would buy a road bike? Now there's different kinds of road bikes but basically they're identified by the drop bar. The drop bar here is the, uh, the real reason you would call it a road bike. Now there's road bikes and there's road racing bikes. Those are the racing bikes are identified by angles and by somewhat their ability to actually race competitively. And that of course is uh, is a big a big area there is when you want to decide how much money to spend to race competitively. But this video is going to be about fitting to the road bike, road race bike, road sport bike. And uh, it will be, uh, we'll be covering both r racers and recreational riders. I'm going to be going back and forth, and uh, a recreational rider might want to take in a little bit of what the racer does, and a racer may want to take in a little what the recreation. You decide for yourself over, over the next course of thousands of miles that you ride, because you're going to be continually adjusting and looking for the ideal position. But today we're going to start you off on a good position and tell you why we do many, many of these things. Now the people that would be purchasing a road bike, which I'm going to refer to this as a road bike for the rest of the video, uh, it can be many different kinds of bikes. This bike is considered a race bike, mainly because of the angles and the wheelbase. The frame determines pretty much whether it's a race bike and of course what size tires you put on it. This frame will only accept the smallest amount of tires so it is a full race frame, a race bike, but at $350 it's weighing in at around 25 pounds and most people won't want to race on this. There's no reason you could race on this if you were extremely strong you would do fine. All the components on here are low tech, very low, low expense, but all the components are extremely strong. Now the strength, I suppose, is what you're paying for in the weight. So I will take strength any day because I don't want anything breaking when I'm 50 miles away from home, deep in the mountains and away from everything. So the way to determine whether a road bike is a race bike or a sport bike is by this angle and the wheelbase, which is the distance between the two hubs. Now the way to tell the uh, wheelbase is very easy because all you have to do is look how this tire is tucked into this seat tube. You can see there's very little clearance. There's only like 10 millimeters clearance with this 725 tire on here. Very little clearance. That means this is a very short wheelbase. When this clearance opens up, then it becomes more then it becomes a sport bike but the sport bike also will have a different angle this is the head tube and the head tube is what determines what kind of uh, bike it truly is this head tube is 74 degrees which means this with a short wheelbase this is a full race bike a true sport bike would have a 72 degree head angle and a longer wheelbase now many of those you'll see today with the flat bars. The hybrids are now more of a sport bike. You could always put 
drop bars on a hybrid anytime. There's no, no reason you can't. You can put a drop bar on there and make a sport bike out of it. Um, as far as sport bikes being available with drop bars, those have become extremely rare. I can't even think of one being sold right now. I'm sure there's something out there. I mean, there's tens of thousands of different bikes. But finding a sport bike will be very difficult with the drop bars. So, that explains the difference between the two bikes. Even though they look similar, they can be completely different. As a full race bike, this bike handles completely different than the sport bike would with the long wheelbase and the shallower head tube angle. So this bike handles about the same as any other race bike made because the frame angles and wheelbase are identical to almost all race bikes out there. 72 or 70 pardon 73 74 and 75 degree angles are full race bikes. You don't see 75s much anymore. They used to be criterion bikes. Again, I think those have gotten rare and I and uh, I couldn't even tell you where to buy one. So this one, this frame it, and angles and the way this bike handles is going to emulate even a $10,000 bike. It's going to feel about the same as far as handling. The difference is, is, uh, is weight, wheel weight, and uh, material and construction and design. That's going to also separate it from other bikes. All bikes, by design, will separate each other from themselves. All bikes are different. Uh, even, even the bikes, all, even the same model, same manufacturer off the assembly line, could be slightly different because you have so many variables involved. You have the brazing and how much time the heat supplied. Now, mass production has probably made this much better. And for the most part, you probably can't tell the difference. But from manufacturer to manufacturer, design, if constructed correctly at the factory with good, good brazing and good quality control, design makes all the difference. So the next part of the bike is, well, how is it designed? And why does design make a difference? In this case, this is an aluminum, design, aluminum mainframe with a steel fork. Now the design on this uses double budding tubing. Now most tubing are double budding. How well the tube is built before it's assembled and brazed together, the quality of the tubing, all this matters. In this particular bike, the double budding is where it gets thicker at the, at the ends. Now where, where that thickness and how much that thickness is at the ends and how much of that thickness is in the middle is all design. That comes from the manufacturer. They design the tubes to be built and then they are sent to a factory to be built. 99% of all bikes are built in one of three factories in the Orient, as this one was in China. Now whoever uh, Windsor designed this bike and whoever designed this bike is, is obviously highly skilled at what they do because the design of this bike is 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 perfect. Um, the ride quality is excellent. The acceleration and stiffness of the bottom bracket are excellent. So everything they did on the design as far as picking out the tubes and putting this together is as near perfect as you're going to get for a $350 bike. So. In this case, that's why I'm still that's why I'm still riding this. I had bought a, another race bike, and uh, I was going to sell this, but uh, as a brand name that no one's ever heard of, I don't think anybody's heard of Windsor very much. Uh, I didn't have any any um, responses to the sale, so I'm going to keep it and ride it, and I'm setting this bike up differently than I am my Moto Bacon race bike. So next we're going to go into, you know, who or why would you choose a bike like this? To choose a bike like this, there's certain qualifications you got to have. For one, you have to be very fit. 
um, any extra belly fat, any extra body fat, and you will not be able to position yourself correctly on a road bike. So if you're buying a bike for the first time to get fit, to get in shape, you're going to want to go with a, with a comfort bike if you're extremely overweight, a hybrid bike if you're slightly overweight. Going straight to a bike like this is going to put you in horrible positions. You're going to end up probably injuring your knees because you won't be able to, to pedal in the correct positions. If you try and bring the handlebars way up to compensate for, uh, for the belly fat, then again, the handling is going to be horrible and it's just a bad choice. So the people buying road bikes are either going to be very fit and ready to race racers very fit, already fit, um, with uh, who have been doing other sports such as running, and you're switching over to riding. If you're already very fit, this this is still can be a good choice. So the only people that should be buying these bikes are people that are already fit, and I'm going to explain that right now. The road bike is set up to be aerodynamic. It's the most aerodynamic of all the bikes other than a time trial or a, uh, or a triathlon bike. We're trying to get our upper body as low or as parallel to the ground as your body will allow. Now your body's only going to allow so much. You're going to have flexibility in your hamstrings and your buttocks and you're only going to be over so far before the roundness of your back starts to round off and the more your back rounds off the less power you're going to be able to put to the pedals and the more out of position and the more chances of uh, actually getting back pain on one of these bikes. So as we're fitting today, and the reason you would buy one of these bikes is because you want to ride fast. You're going to ride fast because <clears throat> you're getting into a very aerodynamic position. And why do we want to get in an aerodynamic position? Because anything over 18 miles an hour on a bike, you're pretty much spending all of your energy just pushing the bike through the air, pushing the bike through a headwind, plus the air. Well, even if in a dead wind like today, you still got to push whatever speed air you're going through. Now, of course, air density changes for if elevation. But for most people, they're going to be riding around an average of a thousand feet above sea level and that's a lot of heavy air to push. So the only way to go f really faster is to get stronger and to get more aerodynamic. Now genetics are going to limit whatever your strength is. You're only going to get so strong and then any advances once you reach your peak genetics will be going to be very very minor. But a difference of a one inch drop on, the, on getting your chest out of the wind is a much easier way to pick up a mile an hour than to train for another 10 years of, of uh, highly intelligent training to try and figure out how to get that extra mile an hour through your strength. So the road bike is for aerodynamics, it's for going fast. So we have narrow tires, lightweight wheels, lightweight bike, and the drop bars to give us, for one, to give us many positions for riding long distances, but also the main, main most important reason for drop bars is if you're riding in a pack, if you're riding in a peloton or a pace line. If you're riding in pace lines, this is the only bar that's truly uh, worth having. Uh, if you're extremely strong, you might be able to ride upright on a hybrid bike, but You'll be pushing much more wind than you would be while riding over the brake levers or on the drops. And the reason is you have access to the brakes in both these positions. The tops of the bars are normally just for relaxing or for climbing. Um, you don't want to be on the tops of the bars in a peloton because your access to the brakes if you're a beginner or an in intermediate, your access to the brakes are going to be too slow. You're going to be over the brake hoods or on the drops where you can grab the brakes at any time. So that's the reason people would 
choose a bike like this. It is for speed and aerodynamics. This, so the rest of this video is going to be setting you up to get as aerodynamic and as correctly positioned for a starting position as we can. And I'm going to show you all the little features of the adjustment to get your final adjustments and how one millimeter of change can make all the difference in the world to comfort and power and everything else. So stay tuned for the next part as we start the fit. Okay, in this section, uh, if you haven't bought your road bike, or if you have, we're going to I'm going to go through a few things of uh, what uh, what are the options you're going to want on the bike. So some of the fit options, of course, are stem length, crank arm length, size of the frame, which is measured in the length of this seat tube from the center of the bottom bracket to the top of the tube. The uh, the length will not will will come with the uh, will come with the height. You won't be able to buy different lengths. That's going to have to be made up with the with the uh, stem or by searching out different manufacturers that, because they all make different length top tubes. Uh, next would be uh, tire choice and what's the material of the bike going to be made out of. Now, of course, everybody says carbon fiber is best. So that's your number one pick. Uh, steel is supposedly more comfortable. Aluminum is the harshest ride. Titanium seems to be the best of a lot of worlds. What material do you pick? Uh, for one, uh, price will determine some of it. Aluminum, of course, is the most inexpensive, with titanium and carbon being the most expensive. And steel, slightly more expensive than aluminum. The materials you pick aren't as important as the manufacturer and the designer who designs it. You can buy excellent aluminum bikes that are very comfortable over the long distance and very good performing bikes. It just depends on how they're designed. Now for the lightest bike, of course, you're going to have to go, if you're, if you're weight conscious, you're going to have to go carbon fiber to get the lightest bike. If you're a recreational cyclist and you're trying to save money, then aluminum properly designed. You're going to have to test ride the bike to see how harsh the frame is. Now the frame absorbs, uh, absorbs shock, the tires absorb shock, the wheels absorb shock, the handlebars can absorb shock <clears throat> if you buy carbon. The aluminum bars don't absorb much at all. And of course, the aluminum stem doesn't do much either. So if you're looking for a comfortable bike, whether you're racing or, or uh, recreational riding, and you don't have much of a budget, then you're looking for a comfortable steel bike or a comfortable aluminum bike. Now the fork becomes the most important part of the bike when it comes to comfort. The fork is going to be transmitting any any vibration and harshness of the road and the major hits and the bumps will be coming 70% through your fork, up through the bars, into your hands and up into your shoulders. And it's what you're going to feel the most. There's a riding technique that you need to develop to keep the shock from coming through the back end of the bike up, into, up through the seat and into your back. But the chain stays. The, and the, for the minor part, the seat stays, which are these, do uh, some shop, shock absorption. But most of your shock absorption on the bike, once the frame is, once you've bought your frame, it's going to come in tire and tire pressure. The wheels will have some amount of suspension too, depending on the way they're laced. Uh, if you go with the cross four, pattern. This is a cross three pattern. They call it cross three because if you look at the spoke from the hub to where it crosses out here, it crosses over three other spokes. So this is called a cross three lacing pattern. You go to cross four, it makes for a longer spoke and a more cushier wheel. 
Now it depends on the, uh, the size gauge of the spoke, the manufacturer stiffness of the wheel, all go into that and the wheel builders, uh, of course, talent is, is part of it too. Uh, you want the spokes to be tightened to a certain level so that if you got a good wheel builder, then the most critical part, if, uh, if you're not building the wheel yourself, is choosing the correct uh, lacing pattern, spoke gauge, and wheels, wheel rim strength. But uh, most of your cushion is going to come from the tires. Now people will say, I like this tire, I like this tire. Everybody has their tire choice because everybody's weight and riding style is different. So if you're looking for comfort, you should be first looking for tires because that's the, that's the most inexpensive way to uh, actually change the ride quality of your bike. Now tire width on a road bike is going to depend on your surface. If you're riding very rough surfaces like chip and seal, which is a very cheese grater type rough surface, and you're going to want a wider tire like a 725 or even a 728 depending on how rough the surface is. Now whether you can put a 28 on a race frame uh, is, is a question. You may not be able to. 20, 25 millimeter width may be as far as you can go depending on the manufacturer of your frame. The next would be the, how the tire is constructed. The sidewall, the thinner the sidewall, the more shock absorption you're going to have. You can go with the if you have a thicker sidewall, air pressure can then make a difference too. And of course, the weight of your body determines all of this. At 195 pounds, I am not able to ride a thin, thin sidewall tire, and I am not able to ride at anything less than the maximum PSI, because when I stand aggressively to climb on a hill, if I'm using a thin sidewall at 100 PSI, I will be driving that rim right through the tire and I'll be, be getting pinch flats in my tubes. So I'm using a specialized uh, tire, which this one is the uh, All Condition, which has very thick sidewall and I've got them pumped up to 125 PSI. On this bike with this well-designed comfortable frame and a steel fork, notice this steel fork has a, has a curve in it. Uh, most of the bikes now are coming with straight blades, which I don't understand. An engineer is going to have to explain that to me because I've not ridden a straight blade fork that rides as comfortable as this curved rake fork does. But when you combine all those things together, uh, you're talking the comfort level of the bike. So you can still have comfort and still have a good performing bike as you mix these things together between wheels, tires, frame, fork, all these things come into, uh, into play. I've never tried carbon fiber handlebars. Um, they, may, they are probably a way to add comfort. Because most of your shock is coming up through the fork and into your hands and shoulders and that's the place you want to get rid of it because the hands are the most sensitive of, of all the body parts. The sit bones and seat are designed to take much more pressure than the hands. We're not designed to be sitting on our hands, but while we're on the bike, we do have a certain amount of weight on the hands. One of the best uh, ways to protect the hands were, were these uh, Spenco gel padded gloves. I used those in Race Across America. I used those for long distance. They were great. Today I can't find them. Today they've taken all the padding out of the gloves, made them very thin, and put all the padding in the shorts, made them very thick, unbreathable, and I don't understand. The whole industry's gone this way, and it's almost impossible now to find a, a thin chamois short and a thick padded, gel padded glove. Now you can adjust your bike to take all the pressure off your hands, but we'll go into that later because as you take pressure off the hands, you put yourself in a less and less more powerful position. So you have to decide uh, which is more important and maybe compromise between the two. That will be later in the fit section. So that concludes 
the, uh, the comfort and construction uh, materials for the bike and why, what you would choose for the bike depends on your budget, uh, your racing or recreational intentions. Uh, you can always just you know, spend money and get something good, but it's much more difficult to find a good bargain that's uh, it takes much more research to find a good bargain that's, uh, that's going to uh, be strong and last a long time. This one I just happened upon and it's been a good bargain. So for $350, anybody that wants to get started on a road bike, this is a, this is a good way to start or uh, go up to the next level, which I would, I would call in the $650 level, uh, where you get a much lighter bike stronger wheels. Uh, next I want to talk about the gearing. Uh, the gearing that comes on the bike sometimes can be swapped out depending on what, uh, what bike you're buying, what manufacturer. But the gearing involves basically three things. That's your cassette gearing on the back, the crank set gearing, and the crank set length of the, of the crank arm. All these things determine gearing. Now your gearing is going to be specific to your fitness level, to what kind of, uh, what kind of riding you're going to be doing, and where. Terrain. Terrain is going to de determine much of your gearing. In uh, Northern California, uh, I live at the very top of the Sacramento Valley, uh, Valley where I have mountains all around me, everywhere but south. So anywhere I go other than south, I will be climbing. And some of the climbs are a couple hours long. And they start off at 2 or 3% grade and end up at 10% grade, 10 to 12% grade. So my gearing choice here would be completely different than if I had lived in uh, Indiana in the Midwest, living in the flats or just rolling hills. So your gearing is going to be uh, something you will have to determine either before you buy the bike or something you learn after you buy the bike is what, you, what you're going to need. First of all, let me uh, note that uh, the cassette gearing, uh, unless you buy a very narrow range, something like an 11 to 21 or a 12, 23, unless you buy a very narrow range, the, uh, the gearing that comes already put together as a cassette are always wrong. I've said this before in my videos and I don't know why after all these years they can't get it right but here we are in a road racing bike so first of all there's hardly anybody watching this video that can turn a 5211 gear that's 52 teeth on the front 11 tooth on the rear at 90 rpm cadence on the crank is very few people watching this video that's going to be able to ride that gear. Yet, that's the gear that ends up on every one of these bikes. As if everybody out there is some kind of pro time trialer that can run a 5211. Most of, the, most of you, if you're a semi-fit, the best you're going to turn is a 5213. And for those of you that are intermediate and never really trained for speed, now we're talking maybe a 4814 is about the biggest you'll need. And for beginners, you could, if you live in a mountainous terrain, you're going to want mountain gearing on your road bike. For those of you living in the flats, the gearing becomes much less important other than you need close spaced gears. The close spaced gears on the rear means the smallest cog. If you're going to start off with a 12 as your smallest cog, then you need to need a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. All those cogs need to be one tooth apart. If you want speed, if you want to train on a road bike, all those have to be one teeth apart from 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. After that, you can go two teeth to 19, and then maybe a three to four teeth spacing after that. But it's so important that those first five gears be one tooth apart because those are, those are the gears that you're gonna be in your top speed. You're gonna be at 90, 95, 100% level if you drop to 90% and you think you can do another gear, when you do that shift, you want a very small gear change back there because you are already at your top level. 
but uh, unless you buy a narrow gear, unless you buy a narrow range, you won't be able to do it. I'm going to be checking into um, custom building a cassette, which should be possible. Should be able to buy the cogs, the body, and the spacers all separate, and pick exactly which cogs you want. I'll be checking into that, and if you can, I will. I will make a video on that, especially for gearing in the mountains, in the flats, for and for uh, for recreational riders. Most, most racers already need, know what they need, but if you're a beginner racer, you're going to want to check out this recreational type gearing video. And uh, that pretty much completes gearing. Uh, whether or not you have the choice of swapping those out when you buy the bike, again, is, is undetermined. You'll have to ask the, uh, the uh, bike shop when you're buying it. Also, you may not know what gearing you want. So, as a suggestion, I'm going to, after, uh, after, after uh, this section, I'm going to put a, up a chart as a suggestion for different trains and different, uh, different level riders to uh, help you pick your first gear set. In this section, we're going to be talking about all the different body types and, uh, and the uh, different intent of riding, whether you be racing, recreational, uh, whether you be getting in shape, whether you're in shape, uh, and what type of body are you going to put on this bike? In other words, what kind of engine are you going to add to this bike? I thought it was kind of funny, all the comments on, uh, on my other video about the weight scam, how people said this. This bike's going to blow you away. This bike will blow you away. This, as if the bike already, you know, comes with an engine. As you can see, this bike doesn't come with an engine other than the, until I put myself on it. So how fast is this bike? Huh? Well, let's see. Whoa! Well, not only is this bike going zero miles an hour, it's also going to just fall over all by itself. Until you mount an engine on this bike, you don't know what kind of speed you're going to get out of it. So you mount uh, a top-level athlete on a low-level bike like this, and you race against somebody on a $15,000 carbon fiber bike that's a that's a, not a high-level athlete. I can guarantee you the speed the speed will be much higher on this bike. So what bike's faster depends on the engine, and that's what we're going to talk about now. And that's the engine and how bike fit is going to be directly connected to your body type and whether you're male or female. Uh, start with the male female. Now typically women have longer legs and a shorter torso than a man. So <clears throat> that in itself kind of kind of removes the women away from a lot of the bikes out there unless they're women specific. So you're looking for a shorter top tube than you normally would get on a men's bike. Now don't confuse the style of the frame, the way the frame's constructed. You know, the women's, a women's traditional old-fashioned frame will have this tube coming down here. So that in the old days, so they could step through the frame uh, with their dresses on. That's the reason they made the frames like that. So just because it's a woman's frame doesn't mean it still has the shorter top tube dimensions that you need for a woman. Now not all women are proportioned like this. A lot of women are proportioned evenly and in which case that in that case the uh, men's bike will be fine. It's just you're going to use a small uh, smaller frame for the most part you know, because uh, the women are generally shorter than the men. So uh, if you do have the traditional women's uh, measurements you might be wanting to look at women specific frames. Uh, you may not need to. Uh, if you are very close to fitting on a men's bike, then just a slightly shorter stem will make up the difference. The trouble with the drop tube bikes, I've been asked if these, if these are weak. I don't really know. I don't think they are. But the trouble with the drop tube bikes are they are normally the lowest quality bikes out there. You can't find a high quality women's dropped tube frame bike. 
So uh, fortunately now most manufacturers are coming out with women specific design frames and you will be able to, uh, to fit to those more easily. Now for, the, for, uh, now for the women and men, we come in different body types and we, and we can classify those in three basic levels. One is the ectomorph, which I fit into, which is a very, uh, which is a, a thin person which can, has a hard time gaining weight and a hard time gaining muscle. Um, we are very, we lack a lot of power. So a power lifter would be the total opposite of me. I cannot lift heavy weights. Um, even though I trained with weights all my life, I got up to a, to a point of, uh, oh, in the leg press, I got up to about 750 pounds for six reps. Now that sounds like a lot, but did that translate to speed on a bike or power on a bike? No. So as an ectomorph, I don't have the uh, I don't have the power. I have endurance. That's my specialty. As you, this is the ectomorph area. On the opposite end of this is the endomorph. They are the people that gain weight easily. They are the people that possess power easily. They can. Without training with weights, they could walk over and do a 200-pound bench press without even thinking about it, where I can't, I probably could never do a 200-pound bench press for as long as I live. These people naturally have a lot of power. Endurance is their downfall. And then you have what's in between, which is um, they called the uh, mesomorph. Uh, which is a which is a body that contains the best of all worlds. It contains strength, it contains power, it contains endurance. They are good all-around athletes. They can do just about anything. It's just they can't do the. They, they usually have trouble with the extremes. Then, they uh, so the one in between would have trouble doing powerlifting. The the the, uh, the endomorph will be the powerlifter, where the Mesomorph can't quite get to that level, and they can't quite get to the level of maybe ult, ultra marathon, ultra distances, 100 mile running races, 3,000 mile time trial bike races. They may not do as well as I do as an ectomorph. And then you put genetics on top of these three body parts, or these three body types, and genetics will be the limit of how far you can go as 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 that body type or as trying to tradition to uh, make a tradi um, transition between the two now there's of course there's an infinite amount of body types in between the range so you're going to it would help with your fit to determine what type of body part what type of body you have is it power is it endurance or is it somewhere in is it somewhere in between because we're going to be fitting the bike for the rest of this video to those type of uh, different bodies. I'm going to be switching back and forth between the body type and the intent of riding. And in the intent, are you going to are you going to train on this bike as a full-blown racer and compete? Or are you going to train on this bike as a as a fitness tool, as a recreational rider? Or are you going to just use the bike as a recreational rider as a touring? and more low, lower level riding where you're going to be at 75% heart rate or less. So you have different body types and you have the different intent of what we're going to, what's the purpose of, uh, of what we're doing on this bike. So as we get into the fit, we will be working with that because the, the power rider may want a slightly different position than the uh, than the endurance rider, and in crank arm length, a power rider may want something different than the endurance rider. The power rider will have trouble coming up to a very high cadence. Um, you know, whether you, whether you're an ectomorph or or, or a endomorph or a mesomorph, you're always in, if you're in a sport, you're always training outside of your specialty area too. If you have lots of power, 
you still want to train for endurance. If you have lots of endurance, you still want to train for power because you can build up a certain amount of the uh, muscle fibers needed, which are fast twitch, low, slow twitch, which are power and endurance, you can increase those muscle fibers through training. So to become a good all-around athlete, you can increase your endurance as a power rider, and you can increase your power as an endurance rider, and then the infinite scale in between. So we're going to be call, taking that into uh, mind as we go into the fit too. So stay tuned for the fit section.